Good day everyone. So for this week's session, we're going to focus on one of the most important topic in fundamentals of nursing, which is all about activity and exercise. And specifically, we're going to learn the basic concepts about activity and exercise and why activity and exercise is important for patients and most importantly, how do we promote activity and exercise to our patients. So I would start our discussion by this photo on the slide right now. What can you see? Why do you think proper body alignment or body posture is very, very important? And the reason is very simple. In proper body position or wrong posture, even when you sit improperly, would cause problems such as back pain. So for today's session, these are our learning objectives. Number one, describe what are the four basic elements of normal movement. Number two, differentiate the different types of exercises such as isotonic, isometric, isokinetic, aerobic, and anaerobic exercises. Number three, discuss the effects of exercise and mobility on the body system. So primarily, we're going to discuss what are the importance of doing exercise. And number four, what are the problems associated with immobility? And number five, develop nursing diagnosis and outcomes related to immobility. Now, when you work as a nurse and when you go to the hospital, you might encounter several patients with problems with movement, with walking, and with mobility. And as a nurse, for you to be able to provide an effective nursing care to this patient, you should understand what is normal mobility and what is normal movement. Okay, according to the book, normal movement is dependent on the functions of these three parts of our body. First is the intact musculoskeletal system. And I'm referring to the bones and the muscles in our body. And it should be intact. It should be functioning. The second one is nervous system. And it refers to our brain. It refers to our blood um, nerve endings. And the third one is inner ear structures, our ears. Now, these three systems, if they are functioning well, a person can attain a normal body movement. Now, what are the basic elements of normal body movements? When do we say that a person have a normal body movement? Essentially, these four elements should be present. The first one is alignment and posture, joint mobility, balance, coordinated movements. And we're going to discuss all these basic elements one by one. The first element of normal movement is proper alignment and posture. Proper body alignment and posture is very important to promote optimal balance, whether the person is standing, sitting, walking, or even lying down. But how does a person maintain proper alignment and body posture? I want you to look at the photo in front of you, and you would see three important points in the body that helps a person achieve proper body alignment and posture. The center line of the body, which normally starts from the head part, down to the shoulder level, and it passes through, through the center of gravity, which is between the trunk and all throughout the base of support. So how does proper body alignment and posture is achieved? According to the book, Alignment and body posture is maintained when the line of gravity, which starts from the head, passes through the center of gravity in between the trunks and through the base of support. Now, I want you to look at the second photo. The person is walking, but still, the line of gravity still passes through the center of gravity and the base of support. Why is it important to maintain a proper alignment and body posture? Essentially, to prevent strains on the joints, muscles, tendons, and ligaments, and internal structures. 
Now, what you would notice when you lie down at night, when you sleep on your bed, and you had the wrong posture or bad body alignment, you, uh, upon waking up in the morning, you will experience body pain. Or when you sit in, in front of your computer and you sit with the wrong posture or your body is not aligned, after several hours, what will you experience? You will feel back pain. You will feel some discomfort. You will feel pain. That is how important body alignment and posture is. The second element of normal movement is joint mobility. And it refers to the movement of the joints. A normal person can attain a normal movement if the joints are able to move to its maximum capacity. And the term that we use in nursing is called range of motion or ROM. And there are several joint movements that you're going to learn when you go to the lab. And you would notice there are several joints in our body that are capable of movement starting from the head part to the neck part to the shoulder area to the arms to our hands to our knees to our hips and to our feet. There are a lot of joints elsewhere in our body and all of them should be able to move to its maximum capacity so that a person can maintain a normal body movement. And why is it important? Because in active joints, we have a lot of patients in the hospital who cannot move and their joints are inactive and that is very dangerous because it might lead to permanent shortening of the joints or we call it as contractures. That's why when we have a patient who is comatose or we have a patient who cannot move, one of our nursing responsibility is to perform exercises to the different joints of the body of our patient in order for that patient to attain a normal movement. The third important element of normal movement is balance. Okay, what is the organ in our body that is responsible for balance? So the answer is ears. Our ears is also responsible for our sense of hearing. But most importantly, our ears is equally important to maintain our balance. Specifically, the labyrinth. The labyrinth is a part of our ears, which contains the cochlea, the vestibule, and the semicircular canals is responsible for hearing and balance. Now, you would notice some patients who have problems with their ears. They would also have problems with their balance. That is how important you should take care of your ears. The last element of normal movement is coordinated movement. And coordinated movement or balanced movement or smooth movement or purposeful movement can only be attained if our brain's functioning is normal. Particularly, these three parts of our brain are important for us to maintain our coordinated movements. And what are these three parts of our brain? We have the cerebral cortex, which is responsible for motor activity, the cerebellum, which is important for our movement, and most importantly, the basal ganglia, which is very important in our posture. That's why you would notice, during accident or injury, if the person's brain or the person's head is involved and either one of these three parts of the brain is affected, the patient's movement is also affected. That is how important our brain is. That is why we need to take care of our brains against any injury or accident because of its essential role in body movement. So when we talk about normal body movement, we are referring to two things. 
physical activity and exercise. And the physical activity is a bodily movement that enhances health. And exercise, on the other hand, is a planned, structured, and repetitive body movement that enhances health. And there are several types of exercises that we're going to learn for this session. And aside from knowing this type of exercises, it is very important also to know why these exercises are important to our body. And most importantly, how do we do these exercises to our patient? So the first type of exercise is called isotonic or dynamic exercise. It is a type of exercise where the muscles are shortened in order to produce contraction and movement. Normally, isotonic exercise is achieved when the person is running, walking, swimming, or cycling. And isotonic exercises is very important because it improves muscle tone, body mass, and it also maintains joint flexibility and circulation. But how do we promote isotonic exercises to our patients? So technically, we cannot ask our patients to run or walk or swim or those items. But how do we maintain or promote isotonic exercise if our patient is confined to the bed? Now, there are three ways on how we can promote isotonic exercise to our patient. And I want you to look at the photo right now. A patient is lying in the bed and is holding an overhead trapeze. We call it as overhead trapeze. With the use of the overhead trapeze, the patients can lift the body off the bed with the use of two hands. By doing such, the person is actually performing isotonic exercise because the muscles on the arms, on the hands, are contracted and shortened. The second example of exercise that we can do with our patients on the bed is lifting the buttocks off the bed by pushing with the hands against the mattress. In this exercise, we are actually causing muscle contraction on the patient's hands and arms. Therefore, it is an isotonic exercise. And most importantly, the third one is pushing the body to a sitting position. We ask our patient to sit on the bedside chair. And we ask our patient to push the body to a sitting position. We are actually causing isotonic exercise. So the second type of exercise is called isometric or static exercise. And this involves muscle contraction but without moving the joint. And this is particularly important in order to strengthen abdominal or gluteal muscles. And what are the benefits of these exercises? It can actually cause a mild increase in heart rate and cardiac output. So, for our patient who is confined on the bed, for our patient who is hospitalized, how do we promote isometric or static exercise? Very simple. We just give our patient a towel or a pillow and then we put it in between the knees and we ask our patient to tighten the muscles on both legs, we can actually cause isometric exercise. There's a muscle contraction, but we are not moving the joint. The third type of exercise is called isokinetic or resistive exercises. And from the word itself, resistive, it involves muscle contraction or tension against resistance. And this type of exercise is very important in order to build up certain muscle groups. I want you to look at the photo right now. And this is common in gyms. Do you know gym? Exercise gym. This is a resistant exercise because a man pushes, you know, pushes the gadget with some resistance. Or when you go to the gym, when a person lift, you know, a, a barbell, a heavy weight, that is actually also an isokinetic exercise because it involves resistance. And why is it important 
to perform isokinetic exercises to our patient. It helps increase the blood pressure and it also helps increase blood flow to the muscles. That is isokinetic or resistive exercise. Exercise can also be aerobic or anaerobic. And from the word itself, aerobic means there is a greater amount of oxygen being taken into the body when a person performs physical activity. For example, cardiovascular conditioning and physical fitness. And an example of cardiovascular conditioning is running. Don't you notice that when you run, when you do jogging, when you um, take a marathon, after you run or after you jog, the tendency of a person is to breathe heavily. So that means more oxygen is taken into the body. That's why it's called as aerobic exercises. On the other hand, we also have an aerobic exercises such as um, weight lifting or sprinting. These activities doesn't require more oxygen from the bloodstream as compared to aerobic exercises. So what are the factors that affects body alignment and activity? The first one is growth and development. When we speak about growth and development and talking about the person's age, okay, so try to compare activity or body alignment of a newborn, a baby, to an elderly adult. So technically, a newborn or a baby has a few limitations when it comes to activity. Because as you all know, newborns have very limited movements. Their movements are more on reflexion. And as this newborn grows, the motor skills, the gross and fine motor skills are also improved and the child can perform additional body activities. And when a person reaches 6 to 12 years old, normally all gross and fine motor skills are matured. That means a 6 to 12 year old child can do a lot of activities already. And normally these skills, these activities, are achieved when a person reaches the age of 20 to 40 years old. However, when a person reaches the advanced age, advanced age means the elderly, the older adults. The problem is with older adults is that they have physiological changes that normally affects their body alignment and body movement. What are these? Most elderly have problems with their muscle tone. Most of them have problems with their bone density. Most of them have problems with their joints. That's why when a person gets older, there's a tendency for them to develop osteoporosis. There is a tendency for them to, to have fractures easy because of those conditions. So how about nutrition and obesity? How does it affect body alignment and activity? When we speak of nutrition, when a person is malnourished, malnourished means there's no adequate nutrients or vitamins or minerals in the body, which affects the growth and the muscles of the bones. That's why if a person doesn't have enough protein in the body, the person appears thin because protein is responsible for muscular growth. Or if the person lacks calcium, or the person lacks vitamin D, normally the person has problems with bone also. How about obesity? How does obesity affect body alignment? So technically, if you are obese, you have some limitations with your movement because of your weight. And normally, if you are obese, you would also some problems with the joints because of your heavy weights. And all these things could actually affect the overall posture and balance. How about personal values and attitudes? Well, if you grow in a family where regular exercise is common, 
the normal tendency for you is to value your regular exercise also. However, if you are born in a family where regular exercise is not properly done or it's not done at all, you will grow up not appreciating exercise also. This is something to do with personal values and attitude. How about external factors? When we speak of external factors, we're talking about environment. Normally, the most important external factors that affect activity is temperature. If it is so hot, if it is so cold, normally the person will not go out and do certain activities or exercise. Correct. How about prescribed limitations? When we speak of prescribed limitations, these are limitations that are intended for other purposes. For example, a patient is advised by the doctor to be on the bed rest. A pregnant woman should be on the bed rest in order to prevent early delivery of the baby. These are prescribed limitations because the doctor wants the woman to be on the bed rest. What else? Those patients who had surgery. Surgery. If the patient had surgery, so technically the person will not move. Why? Because of the surgical wound. Any movement will cause pain. That's why there is a prescribed limitation. Another example is a cast. You know, a cast. When a person has a fracture and the doctor will put a cast. So technically, if a person has a cast, there is a limitation in the movement. And those limitations are prescribed or needed or important. Now, what are the possible adverse consequences of being immobile? Okay. Immobility affects different body systems. In particular, immobility affects musculoskeletal system. We have disuse osteoporosis. When you speak of disuse osteoporosis is that when a person is immobile, normally the bones demineralizes. The bone demineralizes and the bone strength is lost, which means the bones become brittle. The bones become spongy and gradually the bone is prone to fracture. Another one is atrophy. Atrophy is decrease in size. What will happen to the muscles when it is immobile? It decreases its size. Also pain in the joints and stiffness. If you do not move, if you are immobile, normally it is very painful in your muscles and joints. And most importantly, contractures. Contractures is that the muscles is shortened. If you do not use a certain part of your body or a certain group of muscles, the tendency is for it to shrink or shorten. We call it as contractures. Now, what are the possible adverse consequences on the psychoneurologic? Normally, if the patient is immobile for a long period of time, the mood is also affected. That's why there is a mood changes. Mood changes means the patients might be happy and suddenly the patients might be sad. Low self-esteem, the patients might develop low self-confidence on themselves. The patients might have problems in making decisions. These are the possible neurologic side effects. What are the possible metabolic consequences? Decreased metabolic rate. Remember, metabolic rate is very important because it is a rate of utilization of body energy. When the patient is immobile, normally the metabolic rate is low. That's why the patient's utilization of energy is also low. And normally you would know that the patient, patient's metabolic rate is low if the patient is overweight, is obese. That's why you would notice if the person seldom move or do not perform physical activity or exercise, the patient's weight is increased because of decreased metabolic rate. Negative calcium balance, it refers to the calcium deposits on the bone. And normally, if the patient is immobile, the calcium that is supposed to be in the bone is being absorbed into the bloodstream, causing the bone to demineralize and causing the bone to become spongy and prone to accident. Now, when it comes to the urinary system, being immobile has several consequences as, as also, we have urinary stasis. Stasis means 
the urine is pulled down. The urine is um, stays in one area. If the patient is not mobile, the urine is stuck in, in, in the bladder. And once there is a urinary species, what will happen? The crystals, the calcium deposits that are in the urine itself will, will, will uh, accumulate, will form into stone. And we call it as renal calculi or kidney stones. What else? If the patients will not move, the patients might have urinary retention. The urine will stay in the bladder for a long period of time. And that is dangerous. Why? It could be a potential source of urinary infection. And of course, if the patient is immobile, the patients might develop constipation. Constipation is when the patients cannot move out the bowel for several days. Remember, normally, every day, a person should move the bowel, but in case of constipation, even up to one week, they cannot move out their bowel. Integumentary system reduce skin torpor. Skin torpor means elasticity of the skin. Our skin are elastic. However, for patients who are immobile, their skin easily breaks down because their skin are not elastic. Now, when it comes to respiratory system, what are the possible effects? Pulling of respiratory secretion. What do we mean by this? That means the respiratory secretion stays on the lower respiratory tract. Normally, the respiratory secretion should be excreted out of our lungs or else it will cause obstruction or else or else it will cause um it will block the airway and that is a problem to our patients and it will lead to atelectasis atelectasis means the lungs will collapse the lungs will not function well and of course hypostatic pneumonia eventually the patients will develop infection the patients will cough a lot it becomes pneumonia when it comes to cardiovascular system, this is an important consequences of immobility, orthostatic hypotension. Orthostatic hypotension is the sudden drop of blood pressure. When the patient is in supine position for a longer period of time and the patient suddenly sits or stands, there is a rapid shifting of the blood flow. The patient's blood pressure will eventually shoot down. The patient's blood pressure will go down and we call it as orthostatic hypotension. Dependent edema, which means there are uh, certain parts of the body where the fluid will be accumulated and will it appear as edematous. Thrombus formation, if the patient is not moving, what will happen to, to the blood? It will clot, it will form a thrombus, and once a thrombus is there, it might dislodge in certain blood vessels and it might block the circulation of the blood and it would be a problem to our patients. So these are the possible effects of immobility to our patient. And this is the reason why as nurses we should always maintain or promote physical activity and exercise to our patient. Okay, based on the different effects and complications of immobility and impaired physical activity, what are the different nursing problems or nursing diagnosis that we can develop? Well, the most common nursing diagnosis for patients with problems with physical activity and exercise is activity intolerance. Activity intolerance means there is an insufficient physiological energy to endure daily activities. In other words, when a person perform certain activity, he will develop physiologic problems right away. Remember normally, when we do certain tasks or activities, we seldom develop physiological problems. We may get tired, we may get taban, however, we don't develop physiologic problems. However, for some patients with problems, they might develop certain activity intolerance. Now, what are the four levels of intolerance? Level 1, the patient can walk at a regular pace on level ground. They can climb one flight of stairs or more, but more short breath than normally. They would develop shortness of breath right away. For level 2, patients can walk 500 feet on level ground 
and they can climb one flight slowly without stopping. Level 3, the patients walk no more 50 feet on level ground without stopping and they are unable to climb one flight of stairs without stopping. And level 4, this is the worst, even if the patient is at rest, they still develop dyspnea or problems in breathing. Even if they are at rest, they are still experience fatigue or body weakness. This is activity intolerance. So what are the other nursing diagnoses that you can formulate? Perhaps the patient doesn't have an actual activity intolerance, but the patient has the potential of developing it, so therefore we can add risk for activity intolerance. Another nursing diagnosis is impaired physical mobility. This is especially common if the patient has problems in movie, in movement, in walking, the patient has certain limitations in body movement, maybe one body parts or one extremity has a problem. This is applicable, impaired physical mobility. Other nursing diagnosis is sedentary lifestyle. Sedentary means um, the lifestyle of a person is very low compared to normal human beings. They seldom do exercise, they seldom do physical activity, they just sit in their house, they just use their computers, they don't exercise. Those are sedentary lifestyle. And number four is risk for disuse syndrome. From the word itself, disuse means if the patient is not able to utilize certain you know, um, body parts, okay, there's a risk that some body systems some body functionings will be affected because it is not being utilized or it is um, not being fully activated. We call it as risk for disuse syndrome. Other potential nursing diagnosis is ineffective air clearance. Remember as mentioned earlier, if the patient is immobile, there's a tendency that the patients might develop pneumonia or the patients might develop some cough. If the patients develop pneumonia or cough, certainly the patient would have some secretions which can cause problems in the airway. Next is risk for infection. As I mentioned earlier, if a person is immobile for a long period of time, the patient's urine becomes stasis or the secretions of the patients cannot move out of the lungs. The presence of this urinary and pulmonary secretions. These are potential reservoir where the microorganisms can grow. So therefore, the patient is risk for infection. Other potential nursing diagnosis is risk for injury. Remember, we have mentioned that one of the most common effect of immobility is orthostatic hypotension. When a patient is on supine position for a longer period of time and the patient suddenly sits down the patients might develop um, um, orthostatic hypotension and the patients might fall. So there's a risk for injury. Also, another potential nursing diagnosis is risk for disturbed sleep pattern. Well, if um, the patient is um, lack daytime physical activity and uh, the patients might remain awake during the night. So that is a problem because the patients cannot sleep. This is, there is a disturbed sleep pattern. Next is risk for situational low steam. Um, remember, one of the most common effect, uh, adverse effect of immobility is low self-esteem. Um, the confidence of the patient is very low because of lack of physical activity. Certainly, it will have an impact also on, on their situation and we call it a risk for situational low self-esteem. Now, based on the problems and nursing diagnosis that you have identified, what are the possible nursing management that you can provide to our patient? One of the most common nursing responsibility that we should do to maintain physical activity and body alignment of our patient is proper positioning. This is very important. In fact, Many hospitals requires nurses to reposition the patient every two hours. 
And as a nurse, it is very important for you to know the different names and dispositions and why do we do, we do this to our patient? What are the purposes? Okay, the first position is called Fowler's position. In some other books, we call it a semi-fitting position. Okay, and normally in this position, the head part is elevated or raised. There are three types of Fowler's position. The first one is low Fowler's, where in the head part is elevated from um, 30, uh, up to 15 degrees. We also have semi Fowler's position, wherein the angle is elevated from 30 to 45 degrees. And we also have a high Fowler's position, wherein the head part is elevated up to 60 to 90 degrees. Now this position, this Fowler's position, is a very important position, particularly for patients who are having problems with breathing. Those who cannot breathe find this position very comfortable. Also, those patients with heart problems, they normally like this position, okay? And the good thing about Fowler's position is that when the client is in Fowler's position, the gravity pulls the diaphragm down. So that means the pressure of the diaphragm on the chest is reduced. Therefore, the chest expansion and the lung ventilation is increased. That's why it's good for patient, again, those who are having problems with breathing and those patients who are having problems with um, heart problems. Another position is called orthopnic position. And this position is applicable and beneficial for those patients who have problems with breathing when they are in supine position. Now, from the word itself, orthopneic or orthopnea, you have learned this one in vital signs. Orthopnea means the patient has difficulty of breathing when the patient is in supine position. Since the patient cannot assume supine position without having problems with breathing, we normally place this patient in orthopneic position. In this position, the patient sits either in the bed or side of the bed. I want you to look at the photo. The patient is in sitting position. This is very comfortable with the patient. We call this one as orthopneic position. The advantage of this position is that it allows maximum respiration. It allows maximum chest expansion so that patients can breathe well. Another important position is called dorsal recumbent position. In some books, we call it a supine position. Now look at the photo that you have in the slide right now. Okay, the patient is positioned in which the client's head and shoulders are slightly elevated on a small pillow. Supine position. And normally, at home, when you sleep, this is the usual position that you assume. And normally, this position is indicated after surgery, amalia. And during recovery from anesthesia, the patient undergoes surgery, and when the patient returns back to the to the ward or to the room, the patient will be placed in this position. And this position is very important because it provides comfort and facilitates healing after surgery. Again, dorsal recumbent or supine position. Another position is called prone position. I want you to look at the photo on the slides right now. It is a position in which the client lies on the abdomen with the head turned to one side and the hips are not flexed. Okay, when do we use this position to our patient? And what is the advantage and what are the disadvantages of this position? This position is very important in order to promote drainage from the mouth. If the patient is you know, having some drainage, some secretions in the mouth. And if you put the patient in supine position, the patient will aspirate. And to prevent aspiration, you put your patient in prone position. What else? It is the only position that allows full extension of the hip and knee joints. Okay? Second, when used periodically, the, the, the prone position helps prevent flexion contractures. We know already contractures. Shortening of the muscle. Okay, flexion contractures of the hip and the knee. 
However, the problem with prone position is that we cannot put our position in prone position for a longer period of time. Why? Because it will compress the chest. It will affect the breathing of your patient. Okay? That's why we seldom put our patient in this position for a longer period of time. The next type of position is called lateral position or commonly we call it a sideline position. I know this is your favorite position when you sleep. In this position, the patient lies on one side of the body. It could either be on the right side or it could either be on the left side. That's why we have right lateral position and we also have left lateral position. And the good thing about this lateral position is that it promotes good sleep and rest. That's why it is very advisable for the patient. And aside from that, this position helps relieve pressure on the sacrum and heels, especially if your patient has been sitting on the bed or sitting on the chairs for a long period of time. However, the problem with lateral position is that the pressure might cause fatigue on the sternocleidomastoid muscle. And you know already, where is the sternocleidomastoid muscles? It is located in our shoulder area. And if the patient is placed in this position without proper padding, without proper support, the patients might develop fatigue on the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Okay, this position is called sims position or semi-prone position. And in this position, the client assumes a posture between the lateral and the prone position. And uh, this position is very important because there are several procedures wherein the patient is positioned in this way. And what are the possible indications of this position? First, for unconscious client because it facilitates drainage from the mouth and prevents aspiration of fluid. Remember, for unconscious client, if the fluid will go to the lungs, it might cause aspiration and it might kill your patient. But this position allows drainage of secretions. Also, for paralyzed client, it reduces pressure over the sick room and greater throat enter. Why do you want to relieve pressure on the sick room? If your patient who is paralyzed is in supine position for a long period of time, okay, the pressure on the sick room can actually cause wound or pressure ulcer. That's why you put their patient in this position. Who else? Clients who are receiving enemas and clients undergoing tests or examinations in the perineal area. This is the best position. Enema it is a procedure where it introduce solution to the rectum of the patient. Pregnant woman, because it's comfortable for sleeping. Why? Because of the pressure, of the weight, of the growing fetus. It will cause problems in breathing, but in things position, they find it very comfortable. Five people with sensory or motor deficits on one side of the body usually find that lying on an involved side is more effective. So if the patient has paralysis, the other side of the body cannot move. The other side of the body is affected they can find this position very comfortable. Okay, another important nursing management is transferring client. And transferring client between the bed and chair or between the bed and well chair. And when you go to the lab next week or the other week, we're going to demonstrate the proper way of transferring the patient from the bed to well chair or from the bed from stretcher. And we're going to teach you what are the safety measures that you're going to observe when we do this one. Another important nursing management that you need to do um, in case you have a patient with physical activity and exercise problem is providing range of motion. Remember, if your patient is paralyzed or your patient is comatose and they cannot move, so certainly there would be a problem with joint mobility. And we also have mentioned already what are the possible problems if your patients cannot move the joints, right? We have contractures, we have joint stiffness, all those things that we want to prevent by providing range of motion exercises. Now, there are two type of there are two types of 
range of motion exercises. We have the active range of motion exercises and we have passive range of motion exercises. Now, if the patient can perform joint movement, okay, we can teach them active range of motion exercises. Okay, client moves each joint the body through its complete range. We just need to instruct our patients how to do it. Okay. Now, if the patient cannot totally do it, maybe the patient is comatose, maybe the patient is paralyzed, we do the passive range of motion exercises. Passive range of motion exercises, another nurse moves each of the client's joint through its complete range. Now, if you have a patient is paralyzed and comatose, you will be the one to do the exercise with your patient. We call it as passage range of motion exercises. And on the Ponda Lab next week, we're going to teach you how to do, how to perform the different types of range of motion exercise with the patient. Another important nursing management that we should do with our patient is ambulation or ambulating clients. Okay? Ambulating clients means act of walking. Okay? Now, as I mentioned earlier, when you go to the hospital, you might be taking care of patients who have problems with ambulation. And in that case, we nurses should assist these clients to walk or to ambulate. Now, in doing patient's ambulation, there is one thing that I want you to remember before you do the ambulation of your patient. Take note of postural or orthostatic hypotension. As I mentioned earlier, Orthostatic hypotension occur in patients upon assuming a vertical position from lying or sitting position. If the patient has been on the bed for several days or several hours, if the patient has been sitting for a long period of time, and we, when you ask your patient to stand, suddenly the patient will experience pallor, diaphoresis or excessive sweating, nausea, tachycardia or the heart rate increases, and the person feels dizzy, that means your patient is having orthostatic hypotension. Now, what do you do if upon doing ambulating client, the patients develop orthostatic hypotension? The number one management here is avoid sudden change in position. So what do we mean by this? If your patient has been on the bed for several days or several hours, Okay, before you move the patient up to the bed, you ask your patient to sit first for a few minutes and ask your patient to dangle the legs or sway the legs for one minute. This is very important in order to stabilize the blood pressure of the patient. This is very important in order to prevent, again, postural or orthostatic hypotension. Another important nursing intervention that we should provide to our patient is to teach them how to use mechanical aids for walking. As we have mentioned earlier, you might be caring for patients with problems with walking. Perhaps the other leg has a fracture or perhaps the other leg um, has a problem with movements. And in such cases, we will be needing some mechanical aids for walking. And the most common mechanical aids that can assist the patient in walking is the canes. And there are three types of canes that we can use. The first one is the straight-legged cane, letter A. We also have the tripod, letter B. It has three feet. And we also have the quad cane, which has the four feet. Okay. Now, um, this is very important for the patient because it supports them in walking. However, as a nurse, it is very important to remember that when you give or you assist a patient in walking with the use of cane, that cane should be held by the hand on the stronger side. Why is that so? Why the stronger hand should be the one to hold the cane? Well, definitely, if you give the patient or if you give the cane in a weaker head, the patients might fall. Another important mechanical aid that would assist our patient in walking is walkers. Okay? Walkers are better than cane because it can provide more support. Okay? And there are two types of 
walker that we can give to our patient. The first one is the standard walker. As you can see in the photo, on letter A, we call it a standard walker. And the other one is called um, wheeled walkers with wheels. Okay? Now, what is the important thing that you should have in your mind when your patient is a walker? Take note that when the patient is a walker, the client requires partial strength in both hands and wrists, and the patient should have strong elbow, okay? And should be able to bear weight on both legs. And why is that so? Why do you need to assess for, for the strength of the hands and the wrist and the elbow? Remember, when the patient use the walkers, and if the patient doesn't have the strength to move the walkers, then the patients will definitely fall and you will cause injury to your patients. And between these two types of walker, the most advisable type of walker is the standard walker. Why? Because the wheeled walkers is less stable than the standard walker. Okay, another important mechanical aids that can assist our patient in walking is crutches. There are two types of crutches. We have underarm crutches and we have the lost strand crutches. Okay, now, there are important points that you need to remember when your patient has a crutches. I want you to look at the photo number, letter A. Okay, observe that the elbows are bent 30 degrees. This is very important to allow movement of the crutches. In addition to that, the, the space between the crutches and the axilla is two finger breadth. Okay? And aside from that, the hand grips should be at the wrist level. Similarly, if the patient has a low strand crutches in letter B, the elbow should also be 30 degrees, the hand grips should also at the wrist level, and the cuffs should be 1 to 2 inches below elbow bent. As a nurse, make sure these things are in place. Another important thing that you need to remember if your patient has a crutches is to make sure that the length of the crutches is appropriate to your patient or else you're going to cause injury to your patient. And on, on the other hand, the weight of the hand should be borne by the arms. Take note of this. The weight of the body should be borne by the arms rather than on the axilla. Why? Because the pressure of the crutches on the axilla can actually cause compression of the regional nerve which can cause injury. Again, the weight of the body should be borne by the arms and not on the axilla. Why? We want to prevent compression of the regional nerve. The regional nerve is located near to your axillary area. Now, this is very important. When you provide nursing interventions to your patients, when you assist your patients in lifting, transferring, walking, and positioning, there are possible consequences that can actually happen to us nurses. Remember, when you do these interventions, we nurses are prone to imbalance, we are prone to increase energy requirements and there is a tendency for us to develop fatigue and most importantly there is a risk for injury to ourselves when we lift, when we transfer and when we reposition the patient. So how do we protect ourselves as nurses from injury when we perform these nursing interventions? There is a term in nursing that we usually follow in order to prevent or protect ourselves from injury and the term is called body mechanics. It is the term used to describe efficient, coordinated, and safe use of body to move objects and carry out the activities of daily living. In short, or in other words, nurses should always follow body mechanics when you lift, when you transfer, or reposition the patient. Okay? We call this as body mechanics. So what are the underlying principles for body mechanics? Now, the first is the closer the line of gravity is to the center of the base of support, the greater the person's stability. This is very important. The center of the base of support, the more stable the person is. The second one, the closer the line of gravity is to the edge of the base of support, 
the more precarious the balance. And this is very important. If the line of gravity falls outside the base of support, the person falls. I want you to look at the photo right now for you to be able to appreciate the three principles that we should follow when we perform body mechanics. Observe that the circle or the center of gravity remains in the center line of the body. When you lift the patient, when you transfer the patient, or whatever you do to your patient, make sure that the center of gravity remains in the center so that your body mechanics is maintained. So how do we do this in the actual scenario? How do we enhance body balance? We should always widen the base of support. How do we do this one? We spread our two feet, widen the base of support. The wider the base of support, the stronger, our, uh, the stronger is our balance. The second one, lower the center of gravity, bringing it closer to the base of support. So how do you do this? You bend your knees. Okay? Do not bend your back when you lift something or when you move the patient or when you lift the patients, do not bend your back or rather you can bend your knees. This is how you lower the center of gravity so as to maintain body balance. Now for you to be able to appreciate the value of widening the base of support, and the value of maintaining the center of gravity, I want you to look at the photo. The first photo is a person standing. Take note that the center of gravity remains at the body center line. So the, the patient, uh, the, the person is stable. And this is correct. Look at the second photo. The patient, uh, I mean the, the person is walking. But still, the center of gravity is still on the center line of the body. That means, the body alignment is okay and there's a balance. Here's the problematic one. Look at the person in the third photo. Perhaps the patient, uh, perhaps the person is lifting an object and the person is bending the back. What happened to the center of gravity? The center of gravity is outside the center lane. What will happen to the person if the person's center of gravity is outside the center lane and outside of the base of support so technically the, the person will develop what back pain or the pain the, the person might develop injury okay or the person might develop an accident in other words in order for you to be safe in order for you to maintain balance everything that you do even if you walk, even if you stand, even if you bend make sure that the center of gravity remains within the center line through the base of support. Now, another important thing that I want you to remember to, pro to protect yourself from injury or accident when you provide nursing care to your patient is proper lifting. And proper lifting is very important to prevent injury to the nurse. And there is one thing that I want you to remember to prevent back injury. Never lift more than 35 pounds. That is very advisable. If the patient is more than 35 pounds, okay, it could either you ask a person, assistance, you can ask another nurse to help you, or you can use assistive devices. What are these assistive devices that can help you lift the patient? I want you to look at the photo on the slides right now. These are equipments, these are um, supplies that can actually assist and support patient's body so, it's so that it would be very easy to lift the patient. You need not to carry the patient by yourself. You need not to lift the patient by yourself or else you're going to cause back injury. Another way of protecting yourself as a nurse is to perform the proper way of pulling and pushing. Now, when you work at the hospital, you might be you know, pulling some beds or pushing some beds or maybe pushing or pulling some tables and uh, these procedures can actually cause injury to the nurse however there are ways on how you can properly do this by observing this measure now when you push an object it is very important that you enlarge the base of support okay by moving the foot forward look at the first photo 
the boy is pushing the table but the two legs are spread apart the person is actually enlarging the base of support this is very important to maintain balance the second one when you pull an object a person enlarges the base of support by moving the rear leg back or moving the front foot forward look at the photo on the second on the second side the boy is pulling the the object or the table but look at the feet at the age of the person one foot forward and one foot backward okay this is very important in order to maintain support and balance and this is um, very important so you can prevent you know injury to yourself or accident finally in closing these are the important points that you need to remember exercise and activity are essential part of our nursing care to our patient and we nurses we have a very important role to play in order to assist and attain maximum value movement to our patients however in doing this nursing intervention it is very important also for us nurses to maintain body mechanics to prevent injury to ourselves and so that we can provide effective nursing care to our patient and that is all for today's session okay make sure to watch all the videos and understand each concepts and on our next meeting we're going to have a flip classroom and i'll be asking questions to the students and make sure you are ready to answer these questions thank you